Good evening, ladies. Tonight, and we're excited to speak with a gentleman named Tim Parrish, and he guides through the Hammett Valley Fishing Adventures. He predominantly does CJ Strike the Snake River, but he's fished all over. And according to his family, he's fished since he was a toddler in the toilet. <laughs> 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 So let's all welcome Tim Parrish up for a presentation on our local local. Hello. Hello. So I'm Tim Parrish. I'm owner of Freddy Hammond Valley Fish Adventures. That's my daughter right there. She's the one who keeps me in line because I'm yeah. scattered all over the place. And then Matt here is one of the guides that guides for me on the on the lake and the river. So let's get started. And if you have any questions we go through, then just let me know and I can answer them. There'll be plenty. Of, we do a lot of questions at the end. If you want anything you want to ask, we can deal with that. Let's see. Now I'm going to hit this. Maybe. <coughs> okay. Owner operator. I spent 150 plus days a year on the water on CJ Strike in the Snake River. So I pretty much know that river and lake like the back of my hand. I probably spend that many day, nights driving there doing some waterfowl hunting too. So I can get around there in the nighttime too. So anyways, these are all the kind of fish. So half, just on the business side of things, half of my business is fly fishing for smallmouth bass. That's half of my business. The other half of my business is sturgeon fishing. We don't do that with a fly rod, but that's in the lower 48 states. We have the best place in all of the lower 48 to catch sturgeon. So anyways, these are all the different species we catch on the fly rod. We do, I'd say 80% of our fly fishing for smallmouth is done out of boats, bass boats. Um, you can do it in a float tube. Um, the other 20% we do fish the river section and we'll do walk and wade, mostly for carp, sight fishing for carp. Can you go through the species? So, well, right here we have a common carp. That's a largemouth bass. That's a northern pike minnow. And that's a smallmouth. So, and these northern pike minnows, they're, they're a non named species that's in the river. They hit really hard, they fight really good, and then when you put them in the net, they just let you take the hook out and turn them back loose. So they're pretty wonderful that way. Um, this is CJ Strike Reservoir. We're like 50 miles. You can be, you can be fishing in an hour from here at CJ. So, 6,760 acres. It's in Elmore and Hawaii County. There's six, six major boat ramps. Um, the reservoir, I divide it in three sections. It's kind of it. Um, we fish for the warm water species. So there's bass, perch, bluegill, crappie, carp, northern pike, minnow, and catfish. And we've caught all of them on a fly rod before. Um, the cold water species is trout and sturgeon, but they also put kokanee in there about three years ago. And there's a, there are a substantial amount of kokanee salmon in there now that are about 14, 15 inches. Um, so the three sections of the river you have is you have the main snake river at the top coming in, across Highway 51 Bridge, and you take that up to just past Cobar where you got that next big bowl. Now, I consider that the snake river arm. Okay, that section of the river, it warms up earlier than the rest of the reservoir. There's some freshwater springs that come in underground in King Hill. So in, in April, like we have right now, there's 56 degree water in that, in that Snake River section right now. And the magic number for smallmouth bass is 50 degrees. Anything over 50 degrees, the fish are biting. Um, number one reason for that is number one diet for the smallmouth bass is crayfish and the crayfish start walking, crawling around and getting out of the rocks at 50 degrees. Um, so from up above, you know, past Cove Arm coming through the main bowl here up into the narrows, that's the main bowl. 
that water temperature stays cooler, right? So the water temp of the main bowl right now is about 48 degrees, 49 degrees. So it's just not quite there. We're catching fish there, but they're not, the crayfish aren't moving around a lot, and so it's a little cooler. And then the coolest spot that we have is the Bruno Arm. So the Bruno River running in, it's running off right now, and it's around 46, 47 degrees coming down the Bruno Arm. And then all three sections are a different fishery, right? They all have the same fish in there, but they all fish different, okay? The main Snake River Arm coming up on the top is shallow. Most of your depth is about eight to 10 feet. We have some deep holes in there, but most of your fish is eight to 10 feet of water in the, in the main river. When you get in the main bowl of the lake, you got 80 foot of water, 75 foot of water. You got some steep shelves. So when you're fishing up against the, the shelves in the main bowl, they go down straight down 30 foot. So it's a, it's a different type of fishery. And then the Bruno Arm has a lot of grass. It's really a lot of aquatic life in the Bruno Arm. It's, 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 it's a pretty shallow pool. Maybe 20 foot is the max depth. I'd say the average depth in there is about six to eight feet. That Bruno River running in there, there's a lot of aquatic grasses that grow up under the water, a lot of bug life, a lot of little little fish. So it's a, it's, it holds a lot more rainbow trout in the Bruno Arm than they do up in the Snake River section. Okay, any, any questions on the reservoir itself? So ideal spot for folks with like float tubes uh, that won't get blown off the water. Yeah, so float tube here is there's at Jack's Creek, which is on the Brutal Arm here, you could put in, at the very end, there's a little lawn trap and a restroom at the end. You could put in here and come up here and fish in here. If the wind's going to blow out of the northwest, I wouldn't do it because it pushes right into you. But the wind's coming out of the east or southeast, you wouldn't have any problems in there. And you could, you could kick clear across to this end and fish on this side if you wanted to. But all these little tributaries where the water's running through all hold smallmouth bass and trout. You know, it's, it's pretty shallow in there. Yes, you can fly fish pretty good in there. So Cove Arm is another spot that a lot of people go to, which is, I don't have a stick. Is, is Cove Arm in the Snake River section? Yeah, so it's in the Snake River section. There's a little channel that, that causes that. And then that little break, little lake right there is called Crane Falls Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Uh, Crane Falls is a trophy bass lake, so you can only keep them if they're over 20 inches. So there's more largemouth bass in Crane Falls Lake than there are smallmouth. Um, in Cove Arm, that's actually a spot that smallmouth like to come in there and spawn. They'll come, actually come in out of the reservoir and go into the, in the lake to spawn. So you can catch a lot of smallmouth in uh, Cove Arm. And that's a good place to float to because you can't, no matter which way the wind blows, you're not going to go very far. Um, if you get into the actual river section, there's quite a bit of current. So unless you had a float tube or a floater boat with a little electric motor, I'd probably stay out of the main river section. Um, and then CJ Strike, the actual main reservoir, if you were to go where the lawn trap is at the Air Force Marina, if you go out, there's a little jetty. Well, that jetty runs all the way to the dam. And it's, the top of that jetty is like two, three foot. And then it drops off to about 10 to 12. You could fish that whole jetty all the way down. And you couldn't fish the whole jetty in the day at close to, but it's a lot of water there. But you could, that, that's a good place to fish. Where's the dam located? So the dam's located right here. So when it comes out of there, that's the Snake River again. So. Um, that you could put in also one other location that, and you can get down it with a car, but it's really bumpy and I wouldn't do it in wet weather, but there's a road that comes in here to this little cove and there's a dock there. You can put a float tube in there and fish this wall and fish in that little cove there and then it's full of smallmouth bass and crappie. So, and you, you could put a float boat in there easy. Um, then again, I'd just be careful because our prevailing winds there either northwest or southeast, and they're gonna come one way or the other, and it blows just as hard both directions. And 
that's the biggest thing about CJ Striker Reservoir is that wind blows until about May 20th every day. So I so when I do fishing trips start in March, all of March and all April, I only book two to three trips a week because it's it's gonna blow four days and you're not gonna be able to fish. So um, any other questions on the reservoir? Okay. So this is the gear we're fishing with. For bass, we're using five to seven weight rods, eight and a half, nine foot. Floating lines. Almost all my customers just use floating line. Weight board. If we do need to get the weight down a little bit to catch the fish, we'll just use a 12 foot leader of like four sinking, a tippet. That's all you'll need there. Um, we're using monofilament if we're doing top water because mono floats, fluorocarbon sinks, so that we use all fluorocarbon unless we're using top water. Um, 3X, 2X, they're not line shy. Smallmouth bass are not line shy. You, you're you're going to use 10, 12 pounds, that's fluorocarbon as your tippet. They're not, they're, like I said, they. Um, sinking for the cooler months. So that's kind of the bass. The carp, we stepped the line weight up a little, the weight of the fly run up a little bit, um, but not much. Kind of, we catch a lot of carp on a six weight fly rod. Whatever rod you're most comfortable using and most comfortable casting, because carp has been known as the bone fish of fresh water. They're the hardest freshwater fish there is to catch on a fly rod. So it's just, it's just a different. Different species, but when we do fish for carp, it's all sight fishing. So you're casting to a fish if you want one to take it. So Where, how are they feeding then? They feed on crayfish. Almost all of them are feeding on crayfish, and they're tail so up. Shallow water. Though. Shallow water. We're, we're fishing. We're most of the carp trips are all walk and wade. Okay. We'll be in three foot water rest. Water's got to be crystal clear so you see them. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's you'll probably never. I tell everybody who goes with me is you do not see the carp take the fly. I don't care if you put the brightest color in the world. When that fly goes down, that carp's head comes up. If it makes any movement, strip set or set the hook because they got it and it's down there already. They make any kind of movement, you just set the hook and they'll be run. Okay. Please. Are those? Did you say are those carp everywhere? So the carp are in all, all sections of the whole lake and river in there. I concentrate catching all of our carp in the river, in the oh. river section. Okay. We get up in the river section, but it's got to be, it's only certain times a year. So those carp actually migrate out of the reservoir and go up into the river to spawn. Oh. And when they first come up the river to spawn, they're feeding really heavy. Once they start spawning, you see them thrashing around, you're not going to catch them. Mm -hmm. You have to catch them before they spawn. And that's... They usually do that a couple times a year. Um, and we got to get them before the grass grows because the river section will get a lot of grass that'll grow in the river section. And once that grass gets too thick, you just can't get your fly to them. So what's the, what's the two times they're, they're so I say So I say two weeks before the full moon in May and two weeks before the full moon in June. Okay. They like to spawn on a full moon. They'll spawn on a new moon too. And it all depends on runoff. So like this year, we're not going to have a lot of runoff, so the water should be pretty clear for you to see it, see the fish. But if you get a big high year with a lot of water runoff, the water doesn't clear up enough to deal with it. But you can't catch in cold warm. They come in there to spawn. You can't see them in there. Um, so I break it down in different months. So spring, spring bass fishing is March through June. This year is going to be a little bit later. We've had some colder than usual weather lasting longer this year. So our fish still have not spawned. They have, they're not even on bed yet. We're still waiting. They should be in the next week or two, but they haven't. So magic water temps, 50 degrees or higher. And they're just feeding up for the spawn, developing their eggs, get up in shallow water, and they're just feeding like crazy. So. Um, mostly crayfish. Uh, this is the time of year when we catch our largest fish because they're full of eggs. We'll catch fish in that five, six pound range. We'll get maybe four or five a year that size. 
Um, and that's a big small mouth for sea beef strut. Um, they're sight feeders. So sunny days. Smallmouth bass love sunny days. They're not a cloudy day type thing unless you go to the, which I'll talk about top water later. Um, they're sight feeder sunny days. They're on gravel, flat, sandy points, and rocks. That's where they're going to hide out at. That's where the crayfish live. Mostly the gravel and the flats is where they're going to go in and spawn. And these fish will spawn anywhere from 3 foot to 12 foot of water. So they don't spawn real shallow. Um, we're going to use bait fish and crayfish patterns this time of year. We're going to be targeting the fish in 10 foot of water or less. That's why we're not using any kind of sinking lines. Um, there's multiple strip techniques. I uh, love to hold the rod parallel to water and, and strip set on the, on the smallmouth bass and lean on the fish. These things got really hard mouths on them. You're going to be using heavy line. You'll break your pole before you before it'll come out of the fish's mouth. So you really want to lean on them. A lot of people are really used to trout fishing. So they just take it, set it with their small little hooks and the, the trout have really soft mouths. And then you get your fish on a smallmouth bass. If you don't lean on them, they're going to come jump out of the water. Your fly's flying one way and he's going the other. Happens a lot. I can't tell you enough to lean on the fish. So what's another term for lean on the fish? So just hard set? Hard set and just keep pulling. Just keep pulling. Just keep leaning and pulling and that rod really bent until the fish comes and jumps out of the water the first time and actually makes a turn and then he starts going away. Then you can start playing the fish. But the very beginning of that first minute or so you have that fish, you need to lean on it. Go ahead. So I'm, excuse me, I've never heard the term. Okay. <laughs> so is my rod parallel or is it up in the air? So it would be up in there when you're leaning. So it's parallel to the water when you're doing your strip or your lead because you're watching the line to jump. Those fish hit, the, hit pretty hard. They're going to hit your bait pretty hard. Too. So either you can strip set the fish if you want to, or you can just lift. But when you when you lift that rod, you need to just keep stripping and just keep that rod bent as hard as you can until that fish finally will turn and go away from you, and then you can let him go and bite the fish. Mm -hmm. But the rip, that first minute, you need to really pull hard on that fish, or he'll jump and or he'll go the one way and go the other. So. They're not like trout. Like I said, they got real hard mouths. So that whole point is really, oh, sorry. Okay. Is to really get the hook in hook, his mouth. Get the hook in his mouth, yeah. Sure. And like I said, 90% of them fish, when, they, when you hook them like that, the first thing you do is they're going to jump out of the water. So, go ahead. So in Cape Falls, I've had a couple of fish that they dive and dig deep into the mud. And it's like I'm trying to just kind of them out of the mud. Do you have any recommendations for when they do that? Well, are you, are you in grass too at that time? Um, I, I, so I just put good ten, just good tension on the rod and then, uh -huh. and on the sink, and then just let them wear themselves out. Well, not, I mean, I thought I lost them. I just, yeah. They just dig in the mud and then stay there, and you think that you're on the bottom and then yeah. all of a sudden it'll move and it's like oh no yeah. I should be still there. Well those big fish will those big fish will go down I mean they fight. I mean they fight hard. They'll go right down to the bottom and they'll want to rub right on the bottom of the rocks. Have any, you know what tips for when they do that? All I'd say is put some put some weight on them and just hold on. <laughs> just hold on. I like I mean Tight line. <laughs> Have that rod bent like you think you're going to break your pole. And just let them sit there and fight them out. Okay. So. Um, and they're not stuck. They're just fighting. I thought they were stuck. They so here's are, some of the flies we use in the spring. If the water's clear, we're going to use natural colors or white. I don't know what it is about white, but small amount of bass love white. Okay. So we'll use anything with some rabbit hair in it. All of our flies in the springtime are, have the uh, arrow glass eyes and they're weighted and we'll use different weighted uh, glass eyes 
depending on what depth we're fishing in. Um, at the, obviously, the fish are in two foot of water right on the we're using a little bit lighter. Okay. Um, if the water is an off color or muddy color, we're using brighter flies. Because, like I said, they're sight feeders, so they, they want to see the tap that they. Um, I've seen smallmouth bass go 25 feet in a fly. Easy. So, another thing in the spring. Um, they just always have contact with your fly, with your fly line. You don't want to put a lot of bend in it. You always want to have pretty straight line, a lot of contact, because if you don't, they, they can take it and you won't feel them. Okay? Would you say those flies are, are common at CJ Strike or in all areas? I would say all areas. All, I would say all areas. I don't care if it's largemouth bass, smallmouth bass. This is what we use at CJ Strike, but they have, basically there's some sort of silly skirt on there, rubber skirt legs, because it gives a lot of movement in the water, and most all them flies got rabbit hair in them. Okay. So what are you trying to reach in? Crayfish. So not the white one, but all these ones, crayfish. I know that silly green one doesn't look anything like a crawdad, but that thing fly, it's it's such an off color fly to these fish. Some days they just want something odd. You know, you got the most natural fly in the world. You're taken by them and they won't bite it. You put something on there like that, and they hit it every time. So you have to when your fly fish are smallmouth. If you go down a stretch of bank and you you make 25, 30 casts, you don't go bit. You better be changing your fly. So the white fly really is quite attractive. White fly. There's a bait fish. And it's the Utah chub or what that chub, the sucker fish that's in the in the reservoir system. It's white. Its whole belly oh. is white, and it's got a green back to it. And that's what they're eating. That's kind of a little bit later in the spring when the bait fish start coming down. But yes. But that's the main four flies I we use all the time. We don't get bit, we're in trouble. <laughs> So, do you sell them? The flies? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. But we have people that make them. I don't. I don't tie the flies myself. I get so busy, so I have three or four people to tie the flies for me. One of the guys, the guy that showed me that fly, is Mike Kingston. He's on the Boise Valley Fly Fishing Club. His name's Mike Kingston, and he ties a lot of that flies. So. So now we hit summer. We got through the spring, the spawn, the fish are, fish are done doing that. Now they're going to feed up. Now our water temperatures are getting in the 70s, 80s. This is July through August. We're fishing where the bait fish are. They kind of change from crayfish this time of year if they're, because the crayfish in the summertime end up back in 30 foot of water. And those big bass that chase them down, we're just not going to get them with a fly rod. It's, too, it's just too difficult. So we're still concentrating in that top 10 foot of water column, but now we're concentrating on bait fish. There's minnows, all, everything that spawned and had a fry could be crappie, could be perch. Uh, the northern pike minnows, they'll spawn in King Hill, they'll go all the way back into the river system, and that's what they're chasing. So early mornings, late afternoons, we're doing a lot of stripping. We're concentrating on deeper flats, rocky baits with cattails. So any kind of big, steep, rocky bait that has cattails that are in the water, they can hold those bait fish in those cattails. Those fish will be there. And then underwater vegetation. So you get a lot of grass and vegetation. You want to fish those vegetation lines. Um, Fish turn, so I go back to the springtime. Most of the fish we catch in the springtime are anywhere from 13 inches to 24 inches. 24 inches is a big smallmouth, but I mean, that's our fish we're catching. In the summertime, you catch them from two inches to 20 inches. They just change, okay? We won't catch as many big fish this time of year unless it's a cloudy day, and I don't, I can't tell you why, but if you get a cloudy day in August, at CJ Strike, you can catch 100 fish a day on a popper. 
and you can catch them from two inches to 20 inches. So I don't know why they do it. My theory is the fish that are in 40 foot of water on a cloudy day, they want to come up and eat some bait fish, so they'll come up and they'll cruise those shallows and they'll bite all day. So if you don't get a cloudy day, you get two hours in the morning uh, before the sun hits the water. As soon as the sun hits the water, they quit. Um, now the popper technique we use a lot is dead sticking. And I mean, and what I mean by dead sticking, you're gonna throw your popper out there, right up against the bank where the rocks are and the cattails are. You're gonna pop it one time and you're just gonna let the current take it down. You're just gonna sit there. And you might sit there for four minutes and they'll come up and hit it. So you only, you throw it up against the bank, you pop it one time and you just let it drift. And don't do anything else. Just, just bend or keep your line tight so when they hit it, you can set it. But they'll just do that. Um, and then also a pop and three count. So you pop it once, count to three, pop it again. That's just another uh, technique. But they really like the dead sticking. Um, and then work the bait the whole cast. I see so many people that fish this. The boat will be sitting, or we'll be sitting in 30 foot of water, and we'll cast on shore. You'll pop it like four times, get it this far off shore, and they want to pull back and cast another time. So many times our bait bites get when the bait's about four foot from your boat. And they and what the fish is, they're just looking at it the whole time. And then when they, they it gets torn from such or they for some reason they go up and hit it. So I really tell you to work that bait all the way back to the boat or to your float too. Okay. So we will use some sinking lines and we'll use some crayfish patterns and we'll drift on points. If we don't get so on an August day that we don't get a cloudy day all day where you can catch them on poppers, we will actually fish in that 20, 30 foot of water with a crayfish pattern down deeper. And we'll still catch fish, it's just hard. It's just hard. Um, and we'll just drift points. So we'll just take, we know there's a big point that comes out 23 foot of water, we'll throw our sinking line out there, we'll let it get down there. We know we're down there because our bud will start bumping off the bottom. You'll feel it. If you notice my flies, all the flies are tied with the hook up so they don't get snagged in the rocks. And as you're bumping that rock, you just keep drifting your, your float tube of the boat back and you'll get bit that way. Here's a couple of the flies we use. Poppers. This popper here is probably four and a half inches long. So it's pretty good size. This one's probably an inch and a half. But they seem to like anything with any kind of white and avocado in it. This time of year, that's the color of the bait fish. So I just kind of mimic that. Um, oh. And then here's fall. <coughs> fall time is can be, fall will be some of your favorite fishing for smallmouth, especially if two people go on a boat or two people are next to each other fishing. Um, again, we're finding the bait. This time of year, they're feeding up before they go into winter, winter hibernation. So they're putting the feed bags on so they can survive the winter. Okay, so the smallmouth are gonna be in big schools. There might be 50, 200 fish in a school around bait, and this time of year, they're really feeding up, and they'll, they're just cannibalistic. They just go through and just eat. We're moving our baits really fast this time of year. We're not, we're, our slow mode is gone. We're really stripping in that. And also, if somebody catches a fish, hooks a fish, the other person better have his fly right next to it because when you're pulling that fish in, three of them are gonna fall. <laughs> so this time of year, we can get multiple hookups at the same time. We do get a lot of double hookups when two people are fishing together. Um, just because that one instant they're going. Um, yep, they're leaving their summer location, moving to winter grounds. You catch fish all day, all time of day. The weather's really nice in the fall. Sunny days are great. Um, the three freeze days, no bites. 
Basically, in the fall, when you get three freeze days in a row, the fish disappear. They go down to deep and they're done mm -hmm. for the season. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's the second week of September. Sometimes that's the first week of November. You don't know when that's going to But if you get three freeze days in a row, you're, you're, you're done on that, that upper thing. Mm -hmm. um, and we use larger flies this time of year. Uh, everything, the crayfish, the, the bait, everything is bigger because it's had all summer to grow. So we're using larger baits. Um, there are some flies. These ones are bigger, have a heavy rope. And then I was going to talk about carp. Do you want to talk about carp a little bit? Or? Okay. So carp fishing, basically it's, we're fishing them in pre-spawn mode. They're feeding up before they go on the spawn. When carp spawn, they do not feed. They go on a spawn for two, a week or two weeks. And when you see them thrashing the toolies and doing all that, where you're making all that noise, they're not feeding. They're, they got a different mode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a whole different mode. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are sight fishing. So most carp fishing, we do catch, I'll step back, when we're in the springtime fishing for smallmouth with our crayfish patterns, we will catch carp. There'll be, some will be in the same area, you'll get a bite with strip set and bam, you got a fish. That's gonna, you know, 20 pound carp is gonna take you for a ride. But this, we're actually targeting carp. So the only way we target carp is sight fishing in shallow, clear water. The fish are very spooky. Like, color of your clothes really makes a difference this time of year. If, if, if you're wearing something red, every fish is going to bail. Um, if you're in the water waiting and you roll a rock, every fish is going to bail. Um, they're just a very spooky fish. And I mean, you might be in a section of river where you'll have fish for 200 yards and you can see them all. I mean, you can see them all, tail and all that. And if you spook the first fish in front of you, all 200 yards of fish gone. <laughs> you gotta go find a new spot to fish. I mean, they're just, they're just different. Uh, the species of carp? So we have common carp and mere carp where we fish. More mere, mere carp. Mostly, mostly common, but mirrors are starting. We, we didn't have a lot of mirror carp 10 years ago, but we're getting, I'd say 20% of the fish we catch now are mirrors on the fly rod. Now there are areas like down by Parma and that area down there that you can actually catch a butterfly carp. And then there's places, I think, is it Blackfoot Reservoir? One of those reservoirs has a grass carp in it now that we really never really had around here. And I don't know how many species, Matt probably can tell me how many species of carp there are. So, um, and I heard somebody ever ask what the difference was. Uh, so basically what you have is a common carp. The mirror carp is a genetic mutation of a common carp. And basically what it is is your, your average fish has the scales that lay over each other. What a mirror carp actually is, is they lose that scale pattern. And the size of their body, they might just have five or six whole scales and, and the rest of their body would be almost like a leather. So they don't have like the scale plating over their entire body. Um, the other one that we have is the Crucian carp, which is actually relatively new around Loveridge Bridge area. Yeah. Um, they, it's hard to even describe it. They, they look a lot like maybe a, a large tilapia. Uh, they, they don't get huge, uh, about three, three pounds, I think, is the current uh, state record here uh, that I've seen. Um, but they're shaped like a bream. Um, they're forward-facing mouths with no barbels on them. Didn't those species have a black stripe <coughs> along the <coughs> middle part of the body? So that would be one of the suckers. It's a sucker? Yeah, there's there's like three or four different types of suckers that I know of. I, honestly, I don't know the difference between all the, mm -hmm. the suckers. But yeah, one of the types of suckers does, especially when you see them in the water, You'll, you'll see a very defined black stripe and it almost separates a, a greenish brownish top versus the white bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are suckers. Okay. I've seen those. I, I didn't know the carp was 
So, yeah. and then and then the one the other one he was talking about the butterfly. Um, they've been seen from what's the next dam below CJ? Grandview. No, the da next dam. Oh. Um, we yep. used to go there all the time. Swamp Falls. Swamp Falls. Swamp Falls. Swamp Falls. So Swamp Falls. they've been seen from Swamp Falls all the way down through into Oregon now. And what they're still a common carp. They're the same uh, construct, but it's another genetic mutation, much mm -hmm. like the uh, the mirror carp. And they actually grow really long fins like a koi. So when you yeah. see them in the water, they have these big, long, flowing fins behind them. They're super neat to see in the water. Yeah. So, and then... So on these carp, we're using slow, slower moving currents and eddies that we're getting to on the river. Oh my, I don't know why. You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, tech, it's, it's very technical casting on these carp. If you, you know, so smallmouth, I'll relate smallmouth. You throw your fly line out there, and for some reason you don't lay your fly out, it all bunches up in a big hole, right? Mm -hmm. Right in the middle. We've all done that. There's no bad cast in smallmouth fish. I'll say that right now. Mm -hmm. And what I'll do is it all goes in one big bundle, and the bass looks up at it, and when you pull everything away and the fly's left, he'll come up and eat it, okay? If you do that to a car, it just went a quarter mile. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they just don't, they just don't. So very technical casting, neutral clothing, and stealth approach. So it would be a good way to practice to go bone fishing. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's what they call it. Oh, bone fishing. Oh. That's what they call it. So I have, I'll be honest with you, it's something that's kind of involved with me in this guiding business. I have probably about 15 customers. And when I call them, they come because the water's clear enough, the fish are in there, and they want to catch a call. Mm -hmm. So... And these are our carp flies, and these are small. <laughs> they still got the silly skirt in them, but they're very small. They're like number 10, and maybe the biggest, or the 14 being the smallest. A little bit of silly skirt, tan, there's all different ones. Some of them, you know, they make all kinds of different carp flies, but these are the ones that I use. And I've seen, I'll be honest with you, sometimes when the carp are biting, I've seen a carp go come three feet into the fly. Mm -hmm. Right? So but most of the time, they only want to move about that far. <laughs> what, what are these? Crayfish. Yeah. Little tiny crayfish. There's little snails in there. They're eating, you know, crustaceans. Um, yeah. And they're always feeding until they spawn, it seems like. It seems like they got, you know, if you see, and it's anywhere you go, if you see the carp's head down and tail up, he's feeding. I don't know what he's feeding on, but he's feeding. The only other way you can catch these carp, and this is Lake Lowell, if you want to take your float to out of Lake Lowell, on a windy day, find a mud line. Okay? Find, in the summertime, find a mud line in a windy day coming off of a point, and you will see. Nothing but carp mouths up on top doing this. Mm -hmm. Throw an elk care caddis of any color you want and throw it out there on top of that mud line and you'll see one, one of them will come up and grab it and you can set the hook and catch it. I've caught a lot of them like that. Way. I haven't fished well in a long time, but they, but the, so we'll go back to carp size. Like Lake Lowell, they're like three to seven pound fish. You might get one bigger once in a while. The fish that we're fishing for in the Snake River are anywhere from 17 to 25 pounds. Oh so they're big. When you do hook one, they're going to take you to your back and you might be jumping in the boat and might be chasing down the river. <laughs> now, we've caught fish close to 30 pounds before on a fly rod. Um, they shot one last year in one of Matt's tournaments, one of the tournaments they had where they shoot them with bows and arrows. They shot one 52 pounds. Oh, and the state record 60 something pounds. Yeah, the, the, actually the largest common carp in the nation ever shot was right off of Loveridge Bridge where we died. It was over 67 pounds. So 67 pounds for a common carp. So they do get really big. Okay. <laughs> Any, any kind of uh, floating slide, you get up on top. So you'll see it you know, in, the, in the summertime. So 
with the last time it was hot, it would rain well. So usually, most of the time I fished them was a, was a southeast wind. And those carp get right on those mud lines and they just start getting on top. You know, um, you'll see like, come off a point, you'll see like the white foam line that you see in the water that comes off. You'll see those carp just laying in their feet on top, right on top of the water. Yeah, and they'll stretch out. They could stretch out for like 400 yards. Mm -hmm. And then you could just keep kicking your boat into them because eventually you're going to get so close they're just going to take off because they get spooked. Mm -hmm. But then there'll be another pod that you can go to. So, and I don't know if they're actually eating the fly at that time or they're just up there doing this and they just suck the fly in. <laughs> but they, but you, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. A lot of times they're, they're pulling in a lot of like like micro algae and stuff and they yeah. filter like a whale does. Yeah. So they suck in everything and they just filter out yeah. and swallow. Yeah, so your fly could be this far away and if you suck it, it'll just shoot right into the fly. <laughs> and it's in a foam line. It's like a mud foam line that's on the top of the water. Yeah. You see it when, it, when the wind blows, you see yeah. those, yeah. those carp get right in there, especially at Lake and that's not very far from It'll here. look like a hundred ping pong balls <laughs> opening and closing all at once. <laughs> So this is something that came from the Boise Fly Fishing Show. Basically, you know, spread the waters of fish and other anglers. You know, take care of the fish, respect the other anglers, leave it better than you found it. I mean, this is just simple stuff, but it's, you know, I can't tell you how many water bottles and stuff I pick up every time I go fishing just because it bothers me being out there. Um, you know, only fish as close to someone as you'd want them to fish to you. I, I can I can tell you at CJ Strike when it's crappie season, if you try to get in the narrows, you can walk across the boats for a mile. <laughs> you will never see me in the narrows. You can, there's there's so the, there's so many fish at CJ Strike and that Snake River that you can go get away from people and catch just as many fish. I just don't know why they all want to go there. Um, yeah, I know. So. And if you want to fish the same old, just ask them. I mean, there's a lot of times if well, I'll be crappie fishing and they'll know I'm diving, they got to come and say, hey, you mind if we come up? I, I, well, I don't mind. We're not really casting. We're going straight down. It's, you know, there's plenty of water. Um, yeah, and boaters, floaters, don't run your boat or cast through water for others to fish it. I stay away from the bank guys. You know, if there's some people who fish off the bank, I just stay away. I go way around them. I'm going to fish in the bank line. <laughs> So, it's just common sense. <laughs> okay. And then any questions? So this happened last year. We were bass fishing and we caught a double. Okay? That's a common carp. That's a mirrored carp. See how all the scales are gone on this? Two different species caught in the same spot. Okay? And these are average size smallmouth we catch on the reservoir. They're all fun. You know, I have one customer, you pretty much, the tug is the drug, man. <laughs> it doesn't matter if that big or this big. Everybody wants to fill the tug on the end of the line. So, um, any questions? Anything? You know, we talked about anything, so. So, are carp real aggressive like a bass would be? Or you just pretty much have to hit them in the nose? Pretty much have to end the note unless they're feeding. So they, they, like I said, if they're feeding, they can be pretty aggressive. You just have to lay that line out there really good because they got phenomenal eyesight. I, I can't believe how good their eyesight is. You know, the one of the things is they shoot a lot of carp. I mean, they have carp tournaments where they shoot them and they get them out. And, and we need to do that because carp are terrible for going through like a smallmouth bass, you know, they're, they're bedded, and this 40 pound fish comes up and just sucks all their eggs up as they go through their bed. Wow. Right? So now you just lost all the fish that that smallmouth game fish was going to do. So carp are terrible to do. So they do a lot of carp tournaments where they shoot a bunch of them and they get them out and do stuff with them. Um, so they get, so I work around that. I know when the tournaments are. I will not fish for five days after a tournament. If they are shooting carp in a tournament, 
Them fish are so spooky for four or five days. They're, they're just very smart, intelligent fish. I don't know why, but they are. Very keen. Question. So you're saying shoot fish. Yeah. Literally with a pistol machine? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> with a bow and arrow? A bow and arrow. With a bow and arrow. Yes. So that's called, they actually have fishing. It's in the fishing regulations that you can shoot. So they have a bow with an arrow with a reel on it, and you shoot the fish with the arrow, and then you reel them in okay. with the bow. <laughs> so, yeah. But they only do that on non-game species. So that's, so you can only do that with carp, uh, sucker fish, northern pike minnows. That's the only species yep. I know of that's it. that you can sure. shoot with a bow and arrow. You cannot shoot game fish with a bow and arrow, like bass, trout, all the way. <laughs> Don't your That's fishing game. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you talk, I mean, so I have, so we do, we do things called, we have a, a super slam, right? And the five species I fish for are sturgeon, smallmouth bass, carp, uh, crappie, and perch. And four species are pretty relatively easy to catch, which is the sturgeon, the smallmouth. So I have customers, they want to get the super slam, and I don't do it, but that's one of Matt's things that he guides for, is shooting carp. So after they go carp fishing for two or three trips, they don't get one, they go and get revenge by shooting one with a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get their super slam. <laughs> that's not for everybody, but that's, you know, so. Anyways, anything else? Okay. <clears throat> yep. Okay, what about crappie? Can yes. you catch crappie on a fly rod out in the float too? And yes. Can, yes. So what yes. Be, would be the best time of the year since you're in a float too would be probably when they're I would say, spawning. I would say when the crappie come up the spot. So right now the crappie are transition. They're they're in twenty they're somewhere in the twenty foot of water column. They can be in eighty foot of water, but they're sitting in twenty foot and they're moving. They're moving. As soon as this water temperature gets to 58 degrees, they're going to hit the bank. Mm -hmm. Once they hit the bank, you can catch all the crappie you want on a fly rod. Mm -hmm. so, and what kind of fly would you use? So I, it, yellow or white, I use, I downsize to like a number 16 or 14, a white fly or yellow fly. With, it could be, it could be a... Um, like a, just a small blue bugger? Well, it could be a roly burger or an hourglass eye one with a little bit of weight. I usually do a double fly. I put the little bit of heavier weight on the bottom, the lighter weight on top. I do about 18 inches apart. I'll fish with an indicator. And I'll fish those indicators in like seven or eight foot of water. You need a little bit of ripple on the water when you do that. If it's flat calm, you're not going to catch them. You need that indicator in the in the in the wave action to have those flies moving. Um, and then, yeah, it, it, in Cove Arm, so I'll tell you right now, if you are in Cove Arm, if you go out of Cove Arm, there's a little channel, and you go along that rock wall and you push all the way upstream, and there's a little tiny cove upstream. You know, that first tree. In three weeks, you can catch a hundred fish a day. <laughs> cottonwood? You can catch them in cottonwood? Yeah, they, they come in that little. They come in the channel and come in there, but they're a little bit later. So that that cove I told you, I could probably go back. It is, it is called cove. Oh uh, no, well, that's. Because uh... I know there's a campground called cove. You gotta go down that dirt road. Oh, so there's two of them. There's Cobret Campground, and that has an inlet in it. And then, so the here's here's the reservoir again. So this road that comes down to that little tiny cove, this whole bank and that inside of that cove is going to fill with crappie in three weeks. That's one of their main spawning routes. I don't know if you go. So there, there's a road to Cottonwood goes right here. And if you keep going down, you'll see a dirt turn off the next road, and that road will take you right to there. And you got you can park right next to the water, and if you got a float tube or a tube, you can put in there easy. And those fish will run that whole bank from the point all the way in, and then actually around and then inside that cove. Great place to crop your fish.
so we'll easily get to with float tube. And then the uh, that that big inlet at Cove Rec too. Yeah, Cove Rec. Cove Cove Rec. Rec. They'll get in Cove Rec. You might want to point because that would be a good one. So Cove Rec is right here. There's campgrounds there, but there's a cove that's in there. You could you could put your float tube in there real easy. Is that the official game campground? Yes, I think it is. Does that have the big sign that says Cove? I've never. Yeah, the big sign says Cove. Yeah. So that's going to be this one right here. Yeah, the good fishing in there. You can catch a lot of crop in there too. Yep, you can, perfect. There's a lot of largemouth bass in there too. And it's a, it's a no wake zone. It's in the wake zone. Yep, yep. And you get a lot of uh, blue gill in there too. So, yep. No, there's a lot of places you can access and get a float tube down and catch fish. I mean, for a warm water species, a reservoir, CK Strike is the best one in the whole state. Period. Flat out. No, no, they have. Uh, uh, all of my, most of my fishing, so all for the smallmouth bass is all catch and release. Because I want them to replenish itself and that. But crappie, there's no limit on crappie. And there's no limit on yellow perch. If you come fishing with me, you get 10 fish. And I'll clean them for you to take home. If you want to keep more than that, you take them all home and clean them yourself. <laughs> That's how I convert people to only taking 10. <laughs> Ten fish are going to play out on the perch and crop and have a really nice dinner. So um, there's perch in CJ Strike too? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, beautiful oh, perch. Well, yes. and, a great trail. and would you fish them the same way you would? So uh, perch fishing. <sighs> you could get them shallow like this time of year, maybe a little earlier, so March and April. They come up to spawn, so you can catch them shallower, but they're full of eggs, so you rub them spawn. But that time of year, after that, most perch live in about 40 foot of water. So you would need a boat and then just boat or float tube and go straight down. Okay. Uh, most of our perch fishing, they're cannibalistic, so you catch the first perch on whatever you can catch it on, and then you cut that fish up. And they'll just eat little pieces of it? They eat oh, little yeah. pieces, yeah. That's the best way to catch them. <laughs> oh, yeah. You catch the first one, and you just take a pair of scissors and cut a little piece off, put it on a hook, send it right back down there, and you just, you, you'll, you'll catch as many fish as you want. Until it's it's still 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 so that's, that's perfect. You just can't take a baby one alive. And they're, to me, perch are the best eating fish there is. They're the easiest to fillet, the firmest meat, crappie be number two. So would you need like a depth finder to see how deep? So that's that's what I do is I have all my boats all have the latest electronics and you see the fish. I mean it's the electronics these days is phenomenal. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're probably the same. I mean, you'd have the same one that we have. The difference is like I mean I have a fifty inch screen in the front of my boat. <laughs> yeah, like I, I can see, you know. Myself. Yeah. So a <laughs> lot, lot of you know a lot of they'll have little. little uh, you know, little seven inch screens, and because it's right there, it's in your face. It's not like you're going to be walking over the with the boat. with the new li with the new lithium batteries we have. It's really easy to put a fish fly on a float these days. Yes. Okay, this is a different question. That fine. So I'm going to cut my perch up and I'm going to fish it. Am I putting that little piece of fish on a fly and go down, or am I supposed to put a regular? Bait There's a right, regular hook. Regular thing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably work. I knew I was getting in trouble. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I had a guy that came out sturgeon fishing with me with a fly rod. And we we took that all his flies because he special tied them for just this trip. He came for three days. He soaked those three, all his flies, and everything you could imagine trying to catch one. We didn't get a bite in two and a half days. The first 15 minutes we took a piece of chunk bait and put on a regular hook <laughs> and a regular pole, he hooked one in 15 minutes. <laughs> but he tried. I mean, he tried. He tried hard. Three days. If you want to try. I, said, I said, I'll do it, but I've never seen him do it. Go ahead. This is way off topic. Do you feed guys to walleye? No. So the only walleye I know that we have is in 
uh, Salmon Falls Reservoir outside of Twin Falls. So my section of river, I, I stay where I'm at. I have CJ Strike and I have the Snake River up the Blitz Dam. That's about 60 miles of water in the lake and I don't need to go any farther. Mm -hmm. Does it? So. Do you store that? No, no, I do not. But they're, they're only, that's the only fish better than eating the yellow perch. So, yeah. Yes? You don't do any catfish then? I, I don't. Um, if you want to catch catfish, you go to, uh, what's that park down there uh, by Brownlee? Um, start to the nest. Step Park. Step Park. Yeah. So Step Park out of Brownlee, if you want to catfish, they catch hundreds of them there. That's the best right. catfishing place there is yeah. in all of Idaho. Oh, okay. So Step Park, there's plenty of guys. They catch 100 catfish a day there. Oh. Yeah. And, and honestly, anywhere all the way up to Holmdale, they're, they're in, the, in the river everywhere. Oh, yeah. I yeah. thought they were in the river yeah. everywhere. Exactly. I mean, like it's up in here. Oh, yeah. yeah. There yeah. are a lot of catfish in this reservoir. Most of them are right here where Jack's Creek runs in. Yeah. You can catch them offshore. I just, it's just not a species I fish for. We have caught, don't get me wrong, we have caught several on fly rods fishing for bass. They'll yeah. get a lot. But usually when they're spawning and they're a little later, so like June-ish, they'll actually come, those catfish will come up into the rocks to spawn and you'll, you'll instantly catch some that time of year. But we don't, we don't fish for catfish. Yeah, I accidentally caught one last year at yeah. CJ Strike. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, oh, that was the first catfish I ever caught on a fly We rod. caught a 20. Was like, oh my God. <laughs> We turned it loose, but we caught like a 26 pound channel catfish last year fishing for sturgeon. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> so, sturgeon is bait fishing. So, basically, you go up, you just find a deep, find a deep hole. We have some specialty gear, put a piece of bait on, fresh bait. I don't care what it is, it could be a sucker, carb. Uh, Night crawlers, crayfish, they, 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 but they, they're a bottom feeder. They got a big sucker mouth on them and they're always feeding on the bottom. But they're big. If you've never caught a sturgeon or been around one, you should do it because it, it is, you know, me, the most satisfaction I get at guiding is the first time the sturgeon comes to the surface and jumps and someone has a rod and never caught one before. Their look is unbelievable. <laughs> they have no idea. And most of the sturgeon that are in that river section are somewhere between five and a half and nine foot. Wow. So they're not small. You know, I'd say 40% of the sturgeon that we catch are over eight foot. Wow. And they caught one, some 12 year old kid just caught a nine yes. foot 11 one. And that, and he, he, we, he's a guy out there on the same section of the river that we were. I, I know exactly where he caught it and what he was doing. So, but yeah, he caught that big caught 9 foot 11. Yeah, it was huge. 300 pound fish for us. Go ahead. Yes, sturgeon fish is all catch and release, can't even take them out of the water. So you got to get in the water with them to take a picture. Yeah, that's the way on all barbless hooks. Um, your weight. Has to be at least half the pound test is your main line. You have to have a spin. It's all catch and release because they're, they, you know, and we treat them very good. So we use heavy lines, get them in quick, get our pictures, revive them, and let them go. And I've only seen one dead sturgeon in 15 years on the section I've been on mm -hmm. floating. And I don't know, I've heard of someone hitting one with a boat once. Mm -hmm. So, but no, they're, they're, as long as we keep, everybody keeps doing that, I think we're going to have sturgeon for a long time around here. So, I mean, they haven't, they haven't kept a sturgeon in Idaho since 1972. Wow. So, so, yes, I have a card. I have cards if you want. So I have a Facebook page, and I try to put a, report, a fish report on there once a week. So if you want to follow it, it's just... You don't have to come fish with me, but it'll di just let you know what's going on, what they're catching. You'll see pictures, and if it's something you want to do, go do. Yes? Does your website or your Facebook page show any of those slides that you use so that you would know what to maybe go and get? No, but if you want me to, I don't want to put them on this thing, but I'll, I'll okay. email them to you. Okay. I'll even email you the guys that make them for me. You, you got They're pretty reasonable. <laughs> I, mean, I know. You got gems. Yeah. 
You're going to see plenty of them. I got okay. tackle boxes. I'll take a picture when we go. There you go. So yeah. I'm supposed to go Friday, but the wind's getting worse. Yeah, so, hour, so we got to this is my second, just so everybody knows, this is my second trade. I was a pipe fitter for 30 years. I retired, decided I need to go do something. I was getting a little bored, so I go fishing. I do not go fishing in terrible weather. If you book a trip with me and the wind's going to blow more than 50 miles an hour, we ain't going fishing. I'm going to call you up, say the wind's going to blow. We're going to have to push it out for this day. Just won't do it. Because I want to have just as much fun as you are. No one can be more miserable than a 30 mile an hour wind from Castle Bomb.